Good morning, everybody. Welcome back for the second lecture in the Porcelli series. Uh, we are very pleased to have Maria Janowski with us yet again. And so this morning, she is going to be talking about coloring some perfect graphs. Thank you. All right. Uh, good morning. Thank you for coming back. This is a true vote of confidence. Um, so, um, the way this lecture is structured, I'm going to repeat a little bit of what I said yesterday, just in case maybe not everybody remembers everything, and then, uh, and then we'll uh, start with new things. So, it's about graphs. Graphs have vertices and edges, and the two parameters I'm interested in, or two parameters that I'm interested in are the chromatic number and the click number. The chromatic number is the smallest number of colors you need to color the vertices so that the adjacent vertices get different colors. And the click number is the size of the largest click in the graph, where click just means a set of pairwise adjacent vertices. And uh, you can immediately observe that the, the chromatic number is at least the click number. An interesting question is when are the click number and the chromatic number the same? And that turns out to be the case in many nice natural situations, but uh, there's also an artificial example where you can make it true that somehow is not satisfactory from, from a structural point of view, and that's when you take a small graph and then you take disjoint unions with a big complete graph. And so it's true that the click number and the chromatic number are the same because of the you know, big complete graph sitting there, but uh, uh, you know, it's cheating, it's not actually interesting. So then there is a better question to ask, and that's when we say the click number and the chromatic number are the same for all induced subgraphs. Right, for the graph and for all its induced subgraphs, and here's what an induced subgraph means, just a quick reminder. So uh, it's a containment relation, and, and the operation you're allowed to do is deleting vertices, and then if you delete the vertex, you delete all the edges incident with this vertex, but you're, what you're not allowed to do, but you might be tempted to, is delete an edge while keeping both its ends. And so here's, here's the definition. And uh, I'm do an example here. If I start with this graph, this is the induced subgraph of that, because to get this from that, uh, you delete this vertex on all the edges instant with it and nothing else. But this is not an induced subgraph of that, because to get this from that, what you need to do is delete these two edges, and that's not something that you're allowed to do. And so then a graph is called perfect. That's the definition of a due to Claude Parrish. A graph is called perfect if the click number and the chromatic number are the same for all induced subgraphs, including the graph itself. And uh, perfect graphs have uh, many nice properties that I won't repeat, uh, but uh, one remarkable fact is that you can solve various optimization problems that are NP-complete for general graphs. You can solve them in polynomial time for perfect graphs. And these problems ex include finding, finding the largest click in the graph, or finding the largest stable set in the graph, where, largest may, oh, sorry, where the stable set is a set of vertices with no edges between them, uh, and uh, finding, finding an optimal coloring, right, coloring with uh, omega colors. Now, I'm about to, so you can do this in polynomial time, and yet my next uh, slide and the topic of this talk is how to do this in polynomial time. So the point is that this slide refers to algorithms that, that uh, uh, use semi-definite programming. You start with a perfect graph, you write a semi-definite program to compute something that's called the theta function, and then you can solve it, and that gives you the click number and the chromatic number, because they're the same, and, uh, and everything is wonderful. The, in the next slide, I'm going to switch gears and say, now I don't want to use some definite programming. I don't want to use the ellipsoid method. I want to do something elementary from the point of view of graph theory. But, um, but uh, that will come. All right. So here we go. Here's the next slide. I guess I didn't need to announce it like that. Um, so what, what this talk focuses on is finding combinatorial algorithms, meaning ones that don't use the ellipsoid method for basically these problems. Let me just uh, say this more slowly, more detail, and again. Um, so the problem I'm most interested in is finding not just the chromatic number, but 
a natural coloring, right? There's sort of, when you think about coloring, there are two questions. One is, how many colors do you need? The other one is, find the coloring. And this is not the same problem. So what this is meant to say is, chi of G coloring, like three coloring, but chi of G coloring. Uh, so that's a problem I really want to solve. You give me a perfect graph, I produce a coloring with, uh, with chi of G colors. And then there are some other related problems, finding the biggest clique omega of G, finding the biggest stable set alpha of G. Again, there's a definition of, uh, of alpha, maximum number of pairwise non-adjacent vertices. And then there are um, uh, sort of variants of these problems, which are very natural if, you, if you're used to thinking about linear programming. Uh, so weighted clique number, and what that means is you put weights on the vertices, and now I'm not asking for the biggest clique, I'm asking for the heaviest clique. And similarly, uh, weighted uh, <coughs> stable set, uh, max weighted stable set, which means I put weights on the vertices, and what I want is the heaviest stable set, not the biggest stable set. So there's these five problems, but it turns out they're all closely related to each other. And in fact, so as I said, this is the one I'm actually most interested in. But in order to do this, it's enough to be able to find weighted omega. It's enough to be able to find weighted click. And then uh, uh, Groucho, Lovas, and Kramer fixed it up for us, and they know how to move from max click to optimal color, just, just combinatorially without any fancy stuff. And uh, it's also enough, and uh, in a minute it will become obvious, it's also enough to be able to solve this, to be able to solve uh, um, max weighted stable set. Uh, so, all right. So this is, uh, right, so just to summarize the slide, this is a slide we'd like to get an optimal coloring, but it's enough to solve optimal click, heaviest click. That's, that's all the slide really needs to say. So, uh, just to remind you, the complement of a graph is another graph you get by changing all the adjacencies. If two vertices were adjacent, you make them non-adjacent. If two vertices were non-adjacent, you make them adjacent. And it's a theorem that the graph is perfect if and only if its complement is perfect. It's a theorem of Lovas that was conjectured by Berge. So now, at least the equivalence of these two statements uh, is obvious because uh, finding a max uh, weighted clique is the same as finding a max weighted stable set and complement. Now, if, you know, if, I have comp if I have an algorithm for all perfect graphs to find the heaviest clique, well, complements of perfect graphs are perfect, so I also have an, algor an algorithm that for all perfect graphs map finds the heaviest stable set. So, uh, both doing three and doing five is enough to doing one, but on the other hand, doing three and doing five is actually equivalent. Um, all right. So, um, but the next thing I want to remind you is what bash graphs are. And uh, so it turns out that actually there aren't that many graphs that are not perfect, uh, or there aren't that many minimal graphs that are not perfect. And specifically what they are is uh, odd cycles of length at least five and complements of odd cycles of length at least five. And the examples here. And it's obvious that if a graph is perfect, then it doesn't contain any of these and any of those, because for a perfect graph, the click number and the chromatic number are the same for all induced subgraphs. But actually, it turns out that this statement is if and only if. And uh, in any case, just a reminder, a graph is bearish if, if it's like that, if it doesn't contain any of these and doesn't contain any of those even induced subgraphs. And the main reason I uh, mention it is because I'm about to describe various algorithms for perfect graphs. But in fact, what we use it, what we use is that the input is better. Every time I'll find a node cycle or the complement of a node cycle, I'll say, stop, this shouldn't happen. The input is supposed to be perfect, which is the same as better. Right? It's hard to, uh, you know, when you're proving a theorem, it's hard to convince yourself that something is perfect. But it's relatively easy to convince yourself that something is better. All right, so this is just, uh, again, a summary of uh, everything I said. Uh, a graph is better if and only if it's perfect. And the way the proof goes is uh, you prove a decomposition theorem for Berge graphs. Right? So perfect implies Berge is clear. Now you need to prove Berge implies perfect. And what we really prove is that every Berge graph is either basic, we understand it very well, it's something like a bipartite graph, a complement bipartite graph, or something else of that sort, or uh, it admits a certain decomposition. And 
now I mentioned the decompositions uh, uh, yesterday. I'll mention them again today, but I'll uh, but I'll talk more about it. Okay, so this is uh, just a recap with some different different uh, emphasis of what I did uh, yesterday, and now we continue. Uh, so when you have an algorithmic question on on perfect graphs or on any class of graphs where you have a decomposition theorem, what you're tempted to do is to solve the algorithmic problem for the basic graphs and then prove a theorem that says if I decompose a graph via one of the decompositions and I solve the problem on both halves, then there's a way to put the two solutions together to get the solution to, to get the solution for the graph I started with. And uh, you yeah, know we can get reasonably far with this. Um, so, just to remind you, the decompositions we have, there are two decompositions basically. There is two joints, which, which, is, uh, which means the graph looks like this. So, we can partition the graph into two parts, top and bottom. And then the top is partitioned into three sets, one, two, three. The bottom is partitioned into three sets, one, two, three. And everybody here is adjacent to everybody there. Everybody here is adjacent to everybody there. And there are no other edges from top to bottom. And then there is Q partition which is a partition into four sets, one, two, three, four, so that the, this and that form a cut set, and this plus that form a cut set in the complement. So these are basically the two decompositions. And it turns out this decomposition is actually very good for all the problems I've, I've mentioned so far, because you can, in fact, break the graph carefully into what we call blocks or parts, and solve, solve the problem separately in each block, and then put them together, so here's how it works. This is a two join. Um, so the blocks are going to be basically, I want to take the top and the bottom, except when I take the top, I want to keep a small reminder of the bottom. I want to keep one path from here to there that's completely contained in the bottom like this. And so this is, this is like a picture. C1, A1, and B1 is the top, and I keep one path. Now, if you think about bench graphs for a minute, you'll notice that every path like this has the same parity as every path like that, because you can put them together to make an induced cycle. And that means all these paths have the same parity, and all these paths have the same parity, and it's all the same path. So there are two kinds of two joints. There are two joints where all these parities are even, and two joints where all these parities are odd. And it's enough, so when I'm building a block, it's enough to keep let's say the top, plus just a memory of what parity your two join is. So if you're in the situation where all the paths were odd, all you add, all, all you add to the top is just, uh, just, uh, just an edge like this, right? just uh, an edge that uh, simulates a odd path like this. And if it's even, then instead of this edge, you'll just have a single vertex. Uh, so, okay, so I'll continue with this picture where it's an odd two join. So I'll take the two plus this little pass, and I'll take the bottom plus, plus this little pass. And then maybe I need to add a couple more vertices, which I don't want to go into the details of. Um, but basically, if you solve, let's say, the, click, the weighted click problem with this graph and this graph, you can then, in polynomial time, calculate the solution for the whole graph. And the same for <coughs> stable sets and so on. Um, so, Okay, so that's, first of all, that's good news. We are sort of half done. We have two decompositions and one of them works. Uh, second point here is, the reason this, or a reason this, this works well, and the reason I uh, uh, spent some time explaining what this purple gadget is that uh, reminds the top what used to be in the bottom, is that, so I have two graphs, and, you know, they're, so the, the, the sum, so I have this graph and that graph, and it would be nice if the sum of their sizes was, um, you know, at most the size of the graph I started with. So it's not quite true because I have this two extra vertices here and two extra vertices there, but the overlap is bounded. The, the, you know, these two graphs, they're not exactly sort of disjoint in the graph I started with, but, but their overlap is small. Their overlap, I mean, in this picture, it's most two vertices. So really, if you do it correctly, it's something like six vertices, but it's bounded. And that, that's a very important point. That's, that's why you can do all these things algorithm. All right, so now let me talk about skew partitions. <coughs> so first of all, uh, uh, first of all, let's, let's remember again that it's enough to calculate weighted, ome weighted omega, weighted click. 
So now here's a graph that uh, admits a skew partition, and uh, here's a decomposition that I can take. I'll take the middle plus the left, and I'll take the middle plus the right. This is the middle plus the left, this is the middle plus the right. And now, if I calculate uh, you know, max omega here, and uh, I mean, heaviest click here, and heaviest click there, then the heaviest click in the whole graph is just the maximum of the two, right? So you can't have a click that meets both this and that. So that's very good news, except the step of putting the solutions together is, is no problem. You just take the mass. The issue is that when I, uh, okay, so great, so I took this graph, I decomposed it into two. Now, how am I going to calculate the mass click here? Well, I'm tempted to do it again. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'd like to keep going until, until I have uh, no more skew partitions. Right? So imagine this decomposition, so you start with the graph, break it by skew partitions, break by skew partitions, and then by a skew partition, break by a skew partition again, and so on and so on, until you get a decomposition tree and the leaves don't have any skew partitions. Well, the problem is, every time you take a graph and you break it in two, the two parts overlap, and you have no control over how big the overlap is. So algorithmically, algorithmically this doesn't work well. well it, uh, I mean, one way in which it doesn't work well is that uh, you, know, you can do something with certain complexity on this half and on that half, and then you try to write a recursion, it doesn't work. Uh, uh, a way that I find a little, a little bit more illuminating is to say, well, if I look at this tree, and let's say I go to the leaves which are all which which don't have skew partitions, there are too many leaves. There are exponentially many leaves in the size of the graph I started with. So I cannot, you know, run some simple algorithm on the leaf and then say great on the leaves and then say great now I can put it together. There are two. There are, I got the decomposition into simpler graphs, but there are too many of them. So that's no good. Um, but, but that's, you know, with this approach, that's sort of the only problem. So if I could find a set of skew partition in the graph, so that if I decompose by all of them, I end up with pieces that don't admit skew partitions, and uh, the number of pieces is not too big, then all of this would go through. So the only issue here, I mean, I, I say the only issue as if it's simple. It's not simple, I have no idea what to do. But at least it's one problem instead of many. So the problem is, uh, the problem we need to solve is find a set of skew partitions so that, uh, uh, so that uh, uh, you know, you can decompose and the leaves don't have skew partitions but the tree is fall normal on the size of the graph. And, um, um, you know, when I started this talk I said we'd like this uh, coloring algorithms and we want them not to use the ellipsoid method but it's somehow it's, it's not a well-defined question, right? Uh, what is it that I actually want? What's it, what is a combinatorial coloring algorithm? But this is a, you know, a problem I can actually formulate. Is there a, a set of skew partitions in a perfect, is it true that for every perfect graph there's a set of skew partitions so that if I decompose via them, I get a tree with the properties that I want? And that's, that's a question I'm interested in. I don't know the answer, but that's, at the moment that's my favorite question. So that's why I'm spending all this time talking about it. Uh, all right, so what I'm going to do now is show you a few cases where it did work. Where we could find a set of skew partition that's not too big and does everything we wanted. Uh, so I guess, uh, sorry, before that, I'm just going to uh, mention that. Uh, um, so why, why do I keep saying if only I could get to leaves that don't have skew partitions, I'd be done, if, uh, provided there are not too many leaves? It's because of this theorem, right, which probably explicitly uh, I already mentioned that if you do have a graph that if you're given a graph that does not admit a balanced skew partition, and balance is just some technical thing that for the level of discussion in this talk we can ignore, if you have a graph with no balanced skew partition, then you can color it. So if only I could manage to make the leaves not admit balanced skew partitions, that would be one. Um, all right. So now I'm going to tell you the two cases in which I can make this decomposition tree small and, uh, and uh, follow through with the, with the uh, outline I suggested. So the first case is when the graph you start with has no squares, has no induced c uh, So Then there's a pol polynomial time algorithm to get a color. Now, so we said to get a coloring it's enough to calculate weighted omega. Now, that's true if I'm thinking about all perfect graphs. Because in fact what you need is to be able to calculate weighted omega weighted omega and weighted alpha. If you're thinking about all perfect graphs, it's the same question. 
But if you're thinking about a subclass of perfect graphs, it's not the same equation, right? Unless the subclass is self complementary In particular, this class, the class of C4 free perfect graphs, it's, it's not self complementary So, uh, you know, if I wanted to, so, so, so it's, not, it's not enough to calculate omega. One thing that would work is to calculate omega and calculate alpha, but we don't know how to calculate alpha. That's actually an open question. In a C4 free perfect graph, find a combinatorial polynomial time algorithm to calculate uh, the, the size of the biggest states. That's, that's all. Um, uh, so what we do instead is go straight for color. Oh, and, and, and another thing, so we have no idea how to calculate alpha, but on the other hand, calculating omega in C4 free perfect graphs is easy, because they're only n to the fourth biggest clicks, uh, I mean n to the fourth maximal clicks, so you can just enumerate them. Um, so, but what we do is go directly for coloring, and that's what I'm going to explain now. Explain now. And the idea is, we're not going to look at all skew partitions, we're only going to look at some skew partitions. And uh, uh, the way they're restricted would immediately imply that the decomposition tree you get is not too big. So that's what I'm going to explain from now on. So these two partitions we're interested in are called good partitions. And uh, I urge you not to read the slide before me because most of this you don't need. I mean, the, the way so I usually talk about this slide, I basically draw everything I want on the board, and this is just sitting here for reference. So we're not going to do it now, but, uh, but I'll tell you what you need to do. So, so what's a good partition? Uh, first of all, it's a skew partition, but it's much more restricted than that. Uh, so we have left and right with no edges between them. But the middle is much more tightly structured. The middle contains, consists of three clicks, or two clicks, depends how you want to think about it. So three clicks, k1, k2, k3. And k2 is complete to k1 plus k3. I'm not telling you what edges there are between k1 and k3. Right, so clearly it's a skew partition because k2 is complete to k1 plus k3, and there are no edges from L to R. But it's, of course, much more restricted than a general skew partition. Right? Uh, and uh, there are two more things you need. So one important thing is that to be a good partition, you need to separate a track. And what that means is that there is a triad in the graph. So first of all, the triad is a stable set of size 3. And second of all, you need that there is a triad in the graph that meets, that has one vertex in L and one vertex in R. And the reason I need this is because that, would, that will help me count how many skew partitions, how many, sorry, how many good partitions there are in the graph. Uh, so that's uh, the first rule, then think about clicks. And then there is another rule that uh, I think I'm not going to dwell on. But what that does, it tells you what paths from K1 to K3 with interior L look like. And what they look like, uh, so there are some uh, degenerate cases that I really don't want to talk about, but the point is that they look like this. So if I have a path within L starting in K3 and in K1, then its last vertex is actually adjacent to everybody in K1. And what that's good for is putting together color. Right. Putting together max clicks when you decompose by a skew partition, that's easy. But putting together colorings, that's not at all obvious. But uh, I'll come to this in a minute, but this, uh, this uh, uh, property will, will help you with that. Because basically it means that the colorings of the two halves can't disagree too much. So, all right, let's think about this. Uh, so the first theorem is that good partitions are good for coloring. If I give you, uh, so here's a graph with a good partition and I give you a coloring of the middle plus the left and the middle plus the right, then you can put the two colorings together in polynomial time to get coloring of the whole thing. And uh, so let me now go back here. The reason for that is, so suppose I have the two colorings. Now, uh, well, <coughs> so uh, K2 union K, K1, let's say, is a click. So I can get the two colorings to agree on K1 union K2. So now the only problem is that I have a coloring of this and a coloring of that, and they disagree on K3. There is somebody in K3 who is colored color one in the left and color, color two in the right. So then what do you do? You take a temperature, right? That's the only thing we know how to do if two colorings don't agree what you want them to. Now here it is. So I'm st I started in K3, and it's a temperature through L, getting back to K1, because if it doesn't, then you can just uh, uh, you know, switch along it. 
But now the thing is it derives in K1 in this uh, sort of fairly degenerate way, right? Because this one is a tidal colored one or two, and it's complete to everything in K1. So there's only one vertex in K1 that somehow, you know, uh, interferes with, with changing the color of this vertex. This is one in one half and two in the other half. So there's only one guy here that's colored either one or two. And uh, I'm not going to tell you the details, but basically it's, you know, not so many things go wrong and you check. Can they go wrong? And the answer is no. But uh, the, the point of this vertex is that it makes the chemical chains very, very simple or simple enough to handle. All right. So, um, so good partitions are good for coloring. That's, that's, that's good. Uh, so now how do you get these good partitions? Right? That's the next question. Well, that's, uh, that's actually fine, because uh, you know, the proof of the strong graph theorem, somehow it's hard, but on that hand, you constantly feel like you're really, really learning a lot about the graph. And then if you go into, into a special case, things work, work a lot nicer. So suddenly you really understand what's going on. And this is, uh, this is sort of an instance of that. You, just uh, redo a bit of the proof of the strong perfect graph theorem, but it works so much better than the general case. It really makes you feel good. Uh, so what do I mean exactly? Um, so this, these two graphs are called prisms. What a prism is, it's, uh, it's a graph consisting of two triangles and then three paths between them. And the two triangles are disjoint and everything is induced as drawn. And now because you're in a pair graph, these three paths all have to have the same Lengths of the same height. Either they're all even or they're all. Because, for example, if this were all, then this were even, then you go around like this, and, uh, and you get uh, an odd cycle. So they're even prisms and odd prisms. And uh, it turns out that if you have a bash graph uh, with no C4, but um, uh, with an even prism or an odd prism, you can sort of understand you can understand its structure. You build this, um, um, I mean, for, for those of you, so I'll just say a few words for people who are a little familiar with the proof of the strong graph theorem. So you build the strip structures where you kind of uh, fold as much of the graph as possible into something that looks like a prism or maybe a line graph or a larger bipartite graph. And uh, everything still works, but better. You, uh, you build the strip structures and you're able to read off what used to be skew partitions in the general case, but now they're just good partitions. You need to be a little bit careful. You can't just. Uh, you need to be a little more careful than in the proof of the general case of a strong graph theorem. Not every, not every skew partition turns into a good partition, but you can always see that there is a good partition just by looking at the strip structure. So anyway, the theorem from here is uh, that if you start with a graph uh, with a C4 free bash graph that contains a prism, then there is a good partition. <coughs> Uh, all right, so so that's good. So uh, now the next question is, how do you find good partitions? Right. My plan is to start with good partitions and decompose, and, uh, and you know at some point I'll argue that the composition tree is not too big. But the question is, how do you find a good partition? And so there are two two things that happen. One is that actually, if you follow the proof that I didn't show you on the previous slide, it's all constructive and you can do it. But there is a conceptually much simpler thing that you can do. So, uh, the, in a, and, and that just because the graph is C4 free. So the first thing is that in a C4 free graph, there are not too many maximal clicks, only this many. The second fact is that actually you can list all maximal clicks in a graph in this time. And so, if uh, you knew that the number of maximum, so m is the number of edges, n is the number of vertices, and if you know that k, the number of maximal clicks, is not too big, this is polynomial. So, you know, I'm about to look for partitions, about to look for cut sets that consist of pairs of clicks, but I already have a list of all maximal clicks given to me in polynomial time, so I'm, I'm in pretty good shape. Right, because remember, a good partition. In a good partition, the, the cut set is the union of two clicks. So if I have a list of all clicks, I can now look at all pairs and ask, is this a good partition? Well, it's almost true. It's not quite true, because maybe you know, nobody said that this click has to be maximum. 
So what you do is you start, you look at all pairs of maximal clicks, and now you ask, uh, is there a good partition so that k1 union k2 is contained in this maximal click and uh, k2 union k3 is contained in that maximal click? And uh, so here I am, I, I have my two maximal clicks that I'm currently examining, and I ask, uh, is this a cut set? Is this a good partition? And what happens is, well, sometimes it's not a good partition. That means you want to start pruning. You want to start moving vertices out of the cut set into the left of the right. Now, that's in general a dangerous thing, because uh, for every vertex, uh, you, know, you can try to move it left, and you can try to move it right, and that's too many things to try. But in this case, it's, it works well, because so here I am, I just started, and I discovered that I'd like to move this vertex. So I'll try moving it to the left, and I'll try moving it to the right, and once I can try both options. Now I'm continuing with my pruning process, and now suppose there's another vertex here that I'd like to move. Well, but now there's no choice anymore, because if I'm in the branch of the algorithm where I move the first vertex to the right, the next guy I'm moving out of here has to go to the right. It already has a neighbor in the right. It can't go to the left. And that's sort of what saves you, that what you started with was two clicks, so there are not so many decisions to be, to be made whether you go left or right. So, all right, so one way or another, you can find, uh, you can find a good partition. So now the question is, what if there's no good partition? Okay. Um, then, well, so then we know there are no prisms. And then actually we are in excellent shape because that's done. That was done. That had, had been done for 10 years before we started thinking about this. This is always a good, a good thing. Uh, so it's a theorem of uh, Maffer and Turbion that if you have a graph with no prism, then either it's a complete graph, you can color it, or it admits something called a useful even pair. So first of all, what's an even pair? Uh, it's a pair of vertices so that all induced paths between them have even length. And what's good about it is that if this is an even pair in the graph, you can do something called contracting it, um, which means you replace these two vertices u and v by a new big vertex called uv, or often w, and you make the big vertex, the new big vertex, adjacent to the union of the neighbors of u and v. And now the idea would be instead of coloring this graph, I'll color that graph, and I'll give u and v the color of this new vertex, which is still a coloring because this guy uh, was adjacent to the union of their neighbors. So why, why is this good? Well, for, for the following reasons. Uh, so first of all, if this graph is bearish, then this graph is bearish. It's not hard to check. Second of all, the click number doesn't, doesn't change. The click number doesn't go up. Um, so if I, so this is a, bearish, a, sm this is a smaller bearish graph with the same click number, so I do, so I can get a coloring of it with the correct number of colors, so then I can, I can um, uh, uh, convert it to a coloring of that. So that's, that's all wonderful. So now the issue is, again, if I were proving a theorem that says in every bearish graph there is a knitted pair, well, that's great. Then just keep contracting even pairs and, and it's good. But that's not what we're proving. Well, we're not proving it. That's not what my friend John Young proved. They proved that in a graph is, uh, which is C4 free and it doesn't have a prism, there is an even pair. Well, now the problem is maybe I contracted an even pair and I'm not in this class anymore. So now I'm stuck. Now I need to do something else. But that's what useful means. So useful means they promise you're in the class. I'm, I'm cheating you a little bit because, in fact, you can't preserve C4 freeness. Uh, but what it does, it keeps you in a slightly bigger graph where, in a slightly bigger class where everything is still true. Going to that. Basically, useful means you can keep applying this theorem. All right, so now we're ready for the complete algorithm. You decompose by good partitions until you can't anymore. Uh, and that means the leaves of your, so this is now the decomposition tree. This is the graph you started with. These are two halves you get by decomposing by a good partition. Now you look at this, and these are two halves you get by decomposing by a good partition, and so on and so forth. And in the leaves, there are no good partitions left, which means there are no prisms left, which means we can now use the Maffre and Tornion algorithm to just color using even pairs. So that's how this would work. The only thing I didn't tell you yet is uh, the question I started with, why is this tree not too big? Well, it turns out this tree only has this many leaves. 
And the reason is, remember the first thing we said about the good partition is that it has to separate a track. Uh, the, every time I separate, there is a stable set that you know, wasn't the graph I started with, but it's not in this half and it's not in that half. So that means how many times can I separate? Only as many times as the number of stable sets of size 3 my graph has, which is n cubed. So this decomposition tree has at most n cubed internal nodes. And so it has at most n cubed leaves. And this is sort of the trick. You count something that tells you all the kind of skew partitions I'm looking at, there are only not so many. There are only polynomial many. All right, so, so this was the C4 free case. And um, um, so, so the way I'd like to summarize, so I'm about to move on to the next case, next and last case we can do. But uh, I sort of want to. Um, highlight the differences between these two cases. And the way I want to summarize this is that we don't look at all skew partitions, we only look at some skew partitions. And then for this restricted set of skew partitions, we can show that you don't need too many until you get to leaves that you can handle. But on the other hand, when I stop, uh, well, actually, let's let, see. Uh, so now the next case is a more, more recent work with uh, these people. And here we color perfect graphs with bounded, click number, with bounded click number. And I mean, you can really use it to color any perfect graph. The only problem is the, it won't be polynomial. But there's nothing inherently that uses bounded, bounded click number. And what you do here, you're not picky about your skew, your skew partitions. You use every skew partition you can find in the world. But then you notice that actually there are not too many of them. So somehow, uh, so the way you count is more complicated. But on that hand, the structural element is somehow not there. You just use every skew partition you can find. So and now I'm going to, to do the details. Not, not a lot. Uh, so, all right, so this is what I already said. You start with a graph, uh, and you decompose, decompose by a skew partition. And there are a few stopping conditions. So sort of the main point is you stop when the click number went down, right? Um, and because the click number is bounded, it's, it's, you know, it's fine for complexity. You can assume as soon as the click number went down, that's a simpler thing. That's a simpler problem. Uh, another situation where you stop is when there is no balanced skew partition left. And remember, that's, uh, uh, stopping in this situation is good in general because of the theorem uh, uh, with uh, Nikola Trojnion, Diophil Chan, and Kristina Wojkowicz that says as soon as, soon as there is no balanced skew partition, you can call it. The next situation in which you stop, so, so these two are sort of, um, you know, these are the morally correct places to stop. The last two, uh, these are the technically correct places to stop. You have to stop there, otherwise some part of the proof doesn't work. Uh, so th these are the important ones, and these are, these are the ones a little fiddly. Uh, so, uh, so this tells you the graph is not anti-connected. So what does that mean? That means you can partition into two parts and all the edges between the parts are present. But that means the click number of this is smaller than what you started with, the click number of that is smaller than what you started with, and you can just color the two halves with this joint set of colors. So it's, a, it's an okay place to stop, you can definitely handle it. And then the last situation when you stop is when the graph you have is too small. Right? It's only fewer than two omega vertices. Um, so, okay, so you stop in these four situations, and in all of them, you, you can cut. So, so that's fine. So here's my picture. I start with a graph. I decompose it by a skew partition. And I keep on, keep on going like that. And there are two questions. One is, uh, one is why is this tree not too big? And the other one is, again, how do you combine the two colors? So again, in, if I were solving the general problem, it's enough to find omega. But I'm not solving the general problem. I'm solving the problem of bounded click number, which is not a self-complementary class, so I really have to cover. I mean, finding omega with bounded click number is not a very difficult problem, uh, so that's not what we're doing. Uh, so since I'm going directly for coloring, I have this uh, extra step that I wouldn't need to do if only I were solving the general pro pro problem, and that's how do, you com how do you combine the colorings. And I'm going to say something about both. Uh, so let me talk about this first. So the trick is again, you count something. 
just like for the C4 free case, we made sure that the skew partition, every skew partition we use separated the thread, and then we said uh, you know, they're not for, they're not too many internal nodes in the in the decomposition tree. Uh, it's the same idea here. We're going to count something called omega pellets, and I'll tell you in a minute what those are. And then you'll show that every time you separate via skew partition, some omega pellet is uh, is broken. And you also show there are not too many of them. And you also show that, uh, and it's actually something I forgot to say in the C4 free case, but it's true. So if I'm going to count something, I better not double count, right? So I need to show that no omega pellet, if I, if I decompose, I need to show that no, go, no omega pellet is counted both here and there. So, okay, so let me show all these things. So first of all, uh, it would help if I tell you what an omega pellet is. And what that is, it's an anti-connected graph, anti-connected means connected in the complement, that contains an omega clique and has at most two omega vertices. So it's not at all clear that they exist, except if you read ahead, but, uh, uh, but th th these are the objects I'm counting. Anti-connected graphs that contain an omega clique and uh, have at most two omega vertices. Uh, so, um, so, so first of all, it's true that there are not too many, right? There is at most n to the two omega. And when omega is bounded, that's that's well known. Uh, so second of all, I need to prove that they exist. Now, luckily, there is already a theorem about that. Uh, so you need a graph with um, uh, well, omega is good, and. Uh, yeah, so it contains an omega pellet. And in fact, here it says a little more. And what a little more is, they can actually get an anti-connected graph containing an omega click with two omega minus one vertices. Right? We, we require at most two omega. They can get at most two omega minus one. And this will be important in a minute. So now let me show you why, why this is a good thing. So what do I need to prove? I need to prove that every time I do this breaking, some omega, pellet, some omega pellet is broken, and no, no omega pellet is double counted. So first of all, let's see why no omega pellet is double counted. Well, how can one be double counted? That means, that means it's contained in the cut set. It contains in this part. Now, an omega pellet is anti-connected, so it would have to be contained in one of those two sets. Right? You cannot partition the omega pellet into two parts so that everybody in part one is adjacent to everybody in part two. So my whole omega pellet would be contained, let's say here, let's say here. But now there is a vertex there, which is complete, which is adjacent to everybody in it. But an omega pellet contains an omega click, so I cannot have a vertex that's adjacent to everybody in it. So that's not going to happen. You cannot double count an omega pellet. So the next step is to show that there's always some omega pellet that's broken. And that's where we're going to use this theorem with the little more part. So here's a graph. It contains an omega pellet. If it contains an, an omega pellet that meets both this and that, that's wonderful news. I can see it's broken. But in fact, um, so, so OK. And, uh, so let me not say it contains an omega, an omega pellet. Let me say it contains this structure. It contains an anti-connected subgraph that contains an omega click and has at most two omega minus one vertices. So if it meets both this and that, that's great. Otherwise, I can assume it's completely contained here. But now add the vertex from there. That's still an anti-connected graph. It, can, it, it now has at most two omega vertices. But now it does meet both sides. And that's all I want. I mean, this is somehow it's a very simple idea that if you actually try to say the detail, it comes out long. But it's really easy. We find a thing once more that we need. It's not broken, but now we can augment it by one, and it is broken. All right, so that's, that's how you bound the size of the chip. And now, let me say something about combining coloring, combining colorings. And now the sort of nice thing about this, this is actually part of the proof of a strong graphic graph theory. That's how you prove that, uh, uh, that balanced skew partitions are useful decompositions. Except in general, it's not algorithmic. And you'll see in a minute why. But when the click number is bounded, it is. So all this is it's a repeat of the proof from the strong graphic graph theorem. And uh, sort of instead of uh, Phrasing it as a theorem, we now phrase it as an algorithm. Do this, do that, do that. Uh, so, okay, so here's what you do. Here's a graph. 
I broke it by skew partition into two halves, and now I have a coloring of this, and I have a coloring of that, and I'd like to co combine them to get a coloring of that. Okay, so, so here's G1. I have a coloring of G1. Now that means I can add a new vertex that's adjacent to everybody in B and, and to nobody else, and I can still get a coloring of that. Why? Because just take some color from C and put it on this vertex. Uh, and uh, an important step is, that I, so I can still have a coloring, but also important that this graph is still there. And that's where I use the fact that the skew partitions are balanced. Uh, again, I don't want to explain it, but if, if you know what a balanced skew partition is, this is obvious, and if you don't know, then, then it's not worth explaining at this point. But uh, the important thing is that, uh, that this graph is still there. So now you do another sort of neat trick. You do Lois's repli repli replication lemma, but algorithmically. You say, if I have a coloring of this, I can replace this vertex by a click. <coughs> and still get a coloring of that graph. This is not obvious at all. Adding this one vertex was easy. I just use any color from C. So replacing this vertex by a click and saying I, I can now get a coloring. That's, that's really clever. That's Lois's application there. But luckily, that's been done. You can just use it. So you take this vertex, and you replace it by a fairly large click. How large? So large that this, together with B, contains a click of size omega. Right, so the size of this click is omega of the graph you started with minus the biggest click in B. And then you do the same thing in that in that half, right? So this is my second graph. So I add the vertex complete to B, and then I take this vertex and replace it by, by a bigger click. So now, why is this a good thing? Well, the reason this is a good thing is because now, so now I have colors of this and that. And the reason this is a good thing is because the same number of colors appears in B here and there. Because omega of g minus omega of b colors there are taken, and omega of g minus omega of b colors here are taken. So I'm guaranteed that the same number of colors appear in b, which is you know, generally hard, but now we got it. So now you permute colors, so you can assume colors 1 through k appear in b in both colorings, and the other colors appear in c in both colorings. So now what you do is, so look at everybody here who is colored 1 through k. It's people in b. Nobody in C and some people in A. And now look at everybody here who's colored 1 through K. It's people in B, nobody in C, and some people in D. So now look at that graph. Look at the union of these two graphs. So it contains B, nobody in C, some of A, and some of D. I claim that graph is K color because it doesn't have a clique of size K. Right? I have two halves, and this half is k colorable, and that half is k colorable. So this half doesn't have a clique of size bigger than k, and that half doesn't have a clique of size bigger than k, and no clique meets both halves. So, so you have a perfect graph, and it has a smaller clique number, so now I can color. And now you just do, so now we have a coloring of some part of this. We have a coloring of b plus some of a plus some of d with colors 1 through k. Now let's do the same thing for colors that appear in C. So it's colors that appear here, not there, and some of A. Colors that appear here, uh, sorry, here, not there, and some of D. And the click number of that is at most omega minus k. So I can color that with colors k plus 1 through omega. But now that gives me coloring of the graph as um, All right, so that's how you combine colors in two minutes. And uh, so now, well, now we did, we did all of this program. Now the only question is, how do you find these balanced skew partitions? And uh, this was sort of, uh, uh, the world was in a strange state when we were working on this problem. So it is, you can check if a bearish graph contains a balanced skew partition, but you, you can't actually find one. That's a dream of Turkmion. I mean, uh, it's not that you can't, he, he didn't. He could check if there is a skew partition, but he can't produce one, which is what we need here. On the other hand, there was a theorem of uh, Kennedy and Reed that you can produce a skew partition, but they couldn't guarantee that it was balanced. So somehow everything was known except for what we actually needed. Um, but on the plus side, it turns out that you can take the Kennedy and Reed algorithm and basically use exactly the same ideas and get balanced skew partitions. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to talk about the details of this, but it's a very nice idea. What they do is they start with a graph where you want to find 
Well, they're looking for a skew partition, they're looking for a balanced skew partition. Uh, and then you construct auxiliary graphs where something is a skew partition and the graph you started with only if it's a click cut set in the auxiliary graph. I'm cheating a bit because actually you need a cube auxiliary graphs, but for the algorithm that doesn't make any difference. So now on the auxiliary graphs you can look for click cut sets, right? That's, that's known, that's the theorem of Tarkan. And, uh, and that gives you the list of all things that might be skew partitions in the graph you started with. And now you just check, is it a skew partition? That's not hard. Uh, and, and that's how it works. But it's sort of, uh, I mean, I know, it's very pretty, right, to take a new and hard problem and uh, convert it to a classical program in auxiliary graph. This is, this is what you want for a proof to look like, I think, in my opinion. Um, so anyway, so that's, uh, that's how they did it. And then that's how we did it, in their following in their footsteps. And that uh, completes the algorithm for color graphs with bounded click number. Let me stop here. Are there any questions for the speaker? When you, uh, <coughs> when you have these decompositions and decompose graphs and store parts and you repeat that, is there some global way of describing what you get when you decompose pieces and then decompose those? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Right. And unfortunately, that's all I can say about it. <laughs> I don't know, but this is exactly the right question. I mean, Want to get a, a yeah. better idea of what these things really right, look like? Right. I mean, uh, you know, you can sort of draw an eight by eight matrix for two skew partitions, I mean, four by four matrix for two skew partitions, and see you know, what sets can be empty, what gets sets can be non-empty, and it's true that not all of them. But uh, I, mean, I was never able to get any further than that. But uh, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a great question. Yeah. Uh, so for you, live, so it matters. Uh, it can, you can already use it to solve coloring and click uh, all those problems. And the complexity, I, I, I don't remember, I, I thought it was not terribly bad. Uh, but uh, if you compare that with uh, like uh, your algorithm of solving problems with the bounded uh, click size, uh, so that would be better, right? Yeah, yeah, it's not meant to be sort of an algorithm of better complexity. It's meant to be an algorithm that's so then based on understanding graphs better. I mean, I, uh, uh, how can I say, uh, I can't motivate it any better than what I explained, and I agree this is, you know, there's a very valid opinion that this is not well motivated. It seems to me, and, you know, that's the kind of thing that we want to know, but uh, I can also accept that other view. Other questions?